that having spent the time engaging with the scientific method and disproving that the Earth is flat, we're going to kind of interestingly turn right back around and go from be three dimensions and knowing that our spherical or joidal earth depending on how accurate we want to be uh, is in three dimensions you know end up depicting the earth in two-dimensional uh, flat planes with maps we're going to talk about why that's useful and why that's important and some of the benefits and limitations of doing so with maps and so kind of tangentially off of that we, our song to get us in the mood of talking about maps is coincidentally a song titled maps by the yeah yeah yes and so we see an early rendition of one of the first world maps that actually would have been you know, relatively accurate at depicting pretty much all of our continents here, um, created by Leonard Euler. Uh, it was an old map from the 1700s um, in, in, kind of from a European perspective. But you know, there are many old, really cool maps out there you should check out again, Wikipedia and, and many other uh, places out there, um, since many of them now are, are public domain. Uh, you know, definitely worth checking out since they're very interesting, they're very artistic as well. Uh, we're going to be again, focusing on maps and how I would define that being something like providing a generalized two-dimensional view of an area usually seen from kind of above, looking above down at the surface and reduced uh, in size. We'll also be talking about projections and scales here. So again, seeing on the bottom, we're going to be talking about how do we go from, we just spent the whole last lecture unless I'm talking about with this three-dimensional art going from that to two dimensions, uh, for example, with on the right hand side, one of the, uh, these types of projections, the Mercator projection, um, or specifically, it, that is how the Mercator is housed under one type of projection that we'll get to in a minute. Um, but noting that with projections, you know, or this process of transforming that three dimensional spherical Earth to a flat map, noting that all the components that we have on Earth that we might want to represent from Earth, so that those mainly being distance, compass direction, um, so that being kind of denoted by the latitude and longitude as we had uh, you know, north, w south, east, and west, as we just kind of talked about, and then also land area. When we actually try and transition all of those to a, a map, and specifically um, at the greatest extent a world map, we cannot, we find that we cannot actually maintain all those. Uh, uh, components equally. So usually when that's happening is we have to choose a type of map uh, depending on what we want to try and maintain accuracy with but oftentimes sacrificing uh, accuracy in some of those other areas. So for example, I'm not going to spend too much time on these, I'm just going to run through these quickly, but for example, equidistant projections as the name uh, set kind of denotes their equidistance, they allow distance to be represented as accurately as possible, oftentimes sacrificing then uh, compass direction and area. Then formal projections, this is where that Mercator projection that I just talked about comes in, a very famous one. Um, this one uh, renders compass directions correctly and was, you know, was initially created for sea navigation and kind of travel uh, so that uh, sailors could travel along a constant direction and make sure they knew where they were going to arrive. But this is kind of also a famous projection for that. It is very, um, it, it does not maintain distance and area especially um, becomes very, very distorted towards the poles and so it looks like on this map, for example, Africa is as big as Greenland, but actually Africa is much, much larger in size than Greenland, uh, for example. So, um, you know, you know, so oftentimes you're, you're keeping one thing to sacrifice for another. Same type of thing with equal area projections. Now the focus is on areas as, you know, as accurately as possible, but oftentimes, again, sacrificing distance and or compass bearing. So you, in, maps don't have to do don't only have to necessarily um, try and only keep one of these. Um, some maps, so for example, the Robinson projection shown here, um, may distort all uh, three of those components to some lesser degree to um, kind of come to a compromise. And oftentimes these may just simply be used to be more aesthetically pleasing to how we think of the Earth being shaped, um, as we see here. And so again, the choice of the map, really what it comes down to, and what I want to just emphasize here, um, is really the purpose oftentimes that geographers or others are using for that specific map. Um, and to note that you know these problems that I've noted here are at their greatest extent when we are talking about a world map um, but become lesser and lesser and become less of a problem say for only mapping uh, the whole North American uh, continent or United States or you know become even lesser when we're mapping just a single state such as 
generally the state of Oregon, um, and then even lesser and lesser, and really become negligible over very small areas, such as uh, this map to the right that I have as an example of Eugene um, and kind of its street network. And so, you know, the, the further we, you know, the smaller and smaller areas that we emphasize, um, generally the less and less are really, really we actually end up worrying about uh, having to uh, balance between those components. Uh, we just talked through, the, you know, the distance, the compass direction area. Generally, those all end up being maintained um, pretty much without real problem um, over small uh, areas that are mapped extent. And so, also tied to this, we have not only maps and projections, but scales that go along with that. So, the scale is simply that ratio of map units to ground units. So, essentially, what is the relationship between the actual distance on the Earth's surface and the distance, relative distance, on the map? So we can express this in different ways. Sometimes it's just written on the map that will say something like four inches equals one mile or uh, 10 centimeters equals uh, two kilometers, whatever it may be. Um, that may simply be written on the map. Um, it may be a representative fraction that may say, may I say one colon to 100,000. And what that would mean is something like that uh, no matter what units you're using, uh, um, to measure on the map, usually going to be something like centimeters uh, if you're using metric, or inches if you're using imperial units, um, but it could be feet, um, you know, it could be other units, but whatever unit you measure on the map, um, one of those units in the example that I just gave you would equal 100,000 of the same unit on the actual Earth's surface. So again, whatever that ratio may be, um, there are many different ratios in, in types of, kind of ratio maps out there. But if you see that ratio, just know that one of whatever you're measuring on the units on the map is equal to whatever that ratio to unit is um, with the representative fraction. And then it also oftentimes can be something like a graphic scale that we have shown below. Um, and oftentimes you see these as well, um, both on paper maps that are still out there, as well as digital maps such as on your phone. You know, digital maps um, have their own kind of sets of rules we won't too much go into here, but Generally, they, these have representative fraction and or graphic scales, um, or you know, some of these different types of scales that might be shown. And oftentimes, the graphic scales are, are set to scale appropriately or, or essentially to scale along with when you zoom in or out of areas. Um, oftentimes, you might, on say, a Google Maps or other uh, map softwares that you frequently might use. So, now that we've talked through some of the very basic parts of maps that we need to be familiar with, I then want to now move to talking about these ISO line maps, one of the most common types of maps we frequently encounter uh, throughout the many types of phenomena that we're talking about through the class uh, of the term. And so, an ISO note in an, at an ISO line map shows how the phenomenon that we're interested in varies across space by connecting lines of equal values of that phenomenon. So, whatever it is, whether it's precipitation, whether it's temperature, whether it's elevation. Um, whatever it is, um, oftentimes we're going to be seeing these maps where if there's anything we're interested in, that's a con it varies continuously across Earth's surface or in some way across you know, Earth's um, area of Earth that we're interested in um, can be mapped in this way. And so I've drawn a very simplified version here compared to, you know, I also provide some other maps uh, of this uh, in the lesson. But I've drawn, just drawn a very simplified version here of a topographic map, so this would be something that map, so this is mapping elevation. So what I want to note here um, is that there's a difference between on isoline maps of exact versus estimated values here, in the sense that um, so we see three points that I've shown, that I've given you here, A, B, and C on this map, and to note that if you are on an isoline, so if you have a point like point A that is actually falls directly on an isoline, yeah, when you have a point that is on that line, you can actually say with certainty that you know the value of that phenomenon. Again, in this case, we're going to take this to be elevation as a topographic map. So here we see that this is 500 units. We don't actually know what the units are in this case because I haven't provided them for you. Um, so again, it could be feet. If we were using imperial units, it could be meters. If we're using uh, metric it doesn't really matter here, the point being that we know that A, as we can see here, is on that line, and we then know that it is exactly at 500 units of elevation. So you can say at this point. Contrast that to 
if a point falls in between those lines, we then only kind of know a range of values that it that value or that point could be unless otherwise it's been specified. And usually it is not. We're going to assume that it is not here. And so actually on this map, we first also have to determine what we call our interval is, or in this case specifically with topographic maps, it would be a contour interval. Um, but you know the interval of lines, because it's not completely spelled out for us here, um, to note that this outer one, uh, outer line that I've drawn here, kind of thick and darkened in a little bit, has again 500 units. And then we go one, two, three, four, five lines to our next labeled uh, line, which is a thousand units. And so knowing that we have a change between those two, then that are labeled of 500 units of elevation, and counting one, two, three, four, five lines to make that difference, we're going to be a 500 units of elevation change over five lines. We divide the 500 over five. That tells us that each of those lines in between are spaced at 100 units of elevation. So we go from 500 to 600, 600 to 700, 700 800, 800 900, 900,000, and so on. All right, so we see that we can determine that here. And note then with, say, for example, our location B, we see that B falls somewhere in between our 700 and 800 line here. And so we don't know its exact value. We only can estimate it. We only know that it would be somewhere between 701 and 799 because it could fall anywhere between that range of those two intervals. Um, and so you could oftentimes, if it, to, to be approximated, sometimes it will be approximated as the middle or you know, the, in the middle of that range. So you could say it is approximately 750 units. But again, it, in any value in, that it could be, it could be anywhere from 701 to 799. And similarly with location C, we can have our thousand line here. We up another one, two, so this is 1200. We don't have any more above it. And C, C would be somewhere above 1200 units. And we don't have any more lines above that, so we know that it's below 1300 units. So again, the elevation at C could be anywhere between 1200 uh, and one and 1299. We just don't know. Um, that would just be an estimated value. Um, there's a, there, that is a whole possible range of values that could, could be. So also to note here that with digital software now today, um, to kind of take the opposite end of that very simple map that I showed you, and with digital software more and more we're seeing maps that actually are making these continuous surfaces and aren't even necessarily using really ISO lines, or rather can can vary continuously uh, you know, based on this color uh, scale that we have below here. And so this is a, now our world map showing annual mean temperature, and we'll revisit this in a later lecture uh, in module as well. Um, but what I want just to then also do and start thinking about with some of these maps we're going to look at is once again engage with, and I, I want to emphasize continually coming back to in sharpening our critical thinking skills and, and actually questioning a little bit and saying, well, what is the data that is behind this map that informs it, you know, again, knowing that this is a mapped continuous surface, but to know that do we really have locations, you know, do we have every, we can measure every single, you know, across the surface, um, do we have, you know, uh, instruments that would be able to measure, in this case, uh, temperature. And so here's a map then, in turn, that shows all uh, climate network station temperature stations, so anywhere that measures temperature, um, whether those are active or historical, and also kind of based on this color scheme on the bottom, how long those uh, stations are recording uh, doesn't necessarily give us whether those are still present or, uh, I mean, that's what the active versus historical does in terms of the larger versus smaller dots. And especially the smaller dots might be harder to see um, versus the larger one, but we can kind of start to see by looking at this map places where we're going to actually be able to be more or less accurate. So for example, if we look at the United States, I mean, it is pretty much covered completely by stations that have been, have long historical records we can see based on these colors. Uh, so at least up to oftentimes almost 100 years or more. But in, uh, similarly, actually see quite a bit of that across Europe as well. But in, on other continents and other places, so 
lot of South America, Africa, uh, into Asia, and parts of Australia, there is not necessarily as lengthy and or as extensive coverage aerially of you know, places that would be able to make uh, these uh, you know, temperature measurements. And so we can think that, you know, there's there's quite a bit of area covered in some of these continents that there's not even a, a station to measure temperature near them. How can we then determine from that, um, you know, if we're, if we're actually thinking about this, you know, if these temperature stations are simply points, I mean, while the map is a continuous surface, how do we go from those points to a surface? And how do we, you know, make that, you know, make the, all these areas that don't have points, you know, or where temperature is measured near them, how do we assign them a, a, a value uh, in this, in that first map of mean annual temperature? So this relies on what we call spatial interpolation methods. And often this is covered in some advanced courses, um, but I know all of you guys are, are going to be well enough off to handle the kind of some of the very basics of it here that I just want to note. And so there are three main types of um, and actually, really, out of that stem many, many uh, more mathematical equations, more complex mathematical equations, again, that oftentimes are covered in uh, upper-level geography courses to some extent. Um, but here, we just want to note uh, a few of the, the three main types of spatial interpolation. So the first being the nearest neighbor. So essentially being, you know, in this type of assignment, you, you have you, across that continuous aerial surface, you can actually find any given location. In this case, those will be represented by these black dots. Um, and, and really um, knowing, so for example, as I show kind of visually down here in this bottom example, uh, is maybe what wherever uh, the location is that is closer to is to a known value, so that represented in this case by uh, this yellow or tannish dot on the left, and also this green dot on the right. Um, I'm just kind of assigning random numbers here uh, just to give some context but you know to note that anywhere that is closest to that that is nearest to that known value then is assigned that same exact value so we can see again see this both in a linear sense if we were just to think of this as a line along that line anywhere that's closer to 12 uh, ends up being assigned 12 and anywhere that's closer to 25 ends up being assigned 25 um, but again in a more two multiple dimensional sense a two dimensional sense for example Think of this more aerially, so anywhere in these boxes that I've created would fall either into the category of 12 or um, be assigned a value of 25 on the right hand side here. All right, so you can see that also as shown non spatially up here on the top. Um, and so then also we have linear and cubic uh, spatial interpolations, and these are actually we now have variation across space. Um, so with linear, as its name implies, we're at least generally enough familiar. Uh, with linear mathematics and that we kind of have a, a constant change over that space in this case um, where we're going to have so again we have our same example here 12 on the left 25 on the right and for thinking of this linearly or if we change along that so you know we keep going along you know it's just like counting up so 12 13 14 15 you know keep going all the way up 16 17 18 19 21 as you see here and then all the way up to 25 all right so just kind of equally across that space uh, changes to the same amount um, or again two-dimensionally if we have off of you know, we would say just for this point here this location that we've decided um, it would kind of weight the distance um, both in kind of a vertical and horizontal distance um, for both towards this 12 value and towards the 25 value um, and mathematically there'd be an equation oftentimes to kind of calculate out this final value um, just as an example here, it might be something like 18. Um, so cubic um, does much the same uh, exact type of idea, except for that oftentimes it's then weighting more than two points um, kind of across greater distances um, and, and or um, the main difference also is that uh, there's not necessarily a linear, uh, a constant change, rate of change um, between our locations, but um, we might see it more of an exponential type of change between locations and so we might have a much greater rate of change close to a point or a known point and then that falls off um, and it's much less of uh, a further distance away for example so um, again I don't want to emphasize and get into that too much for you but I just want you to be aware of these as these are you know methods that are important to us because a lot of these maps that we're going to be looking at these ice line types of maps that are continuous services 
um, that are often derived from point uh, or only you know location based measurements um, you know, they are very important and impact what we see on a final map and to wrap up one other point I want to make also in relation to you know, bringing back this annual mean temperature map is this other issue of color deficiency or uh, what we often term color blindness and to note that certain colors can be very difficult or impossible to, to discern for uh, some subset of the general populace um, you know, one of the most common types uh, really the most common type of being this red green color deficiency where it can be difficult in discerning in between those or it can be uh, kind of having the deficiency in being able to discern a red and or a green color um, from others. And so just to note, you know, I want to bring this up. So in, for example, on this map on the right, it might be difficult to discern uh, certain colors or shades of those colors, um, the way this map has been set up. So the question kind of then becomes, well, how best do we deal with this? Um, because it could be a number of ways we might go about doing so. And so you know, if we actually were able to go back and make maps, um, one way might be to make uh, maps or you know really any visual media and so you know that's where I just want to bring this up here not only in terms of maps and the maps we're going to be looking at in this class but more generally with visual media you know oftentimes you might not be creating a map but you might be creating some other media that has vibrant colors and this is important to keep in mind and so you know there you can I've, I've noted a series of um, links here where we have you can go to these and you know they are able to walk you through uh, color deficiency safe colors or combinations of colors um, that are you know, safe depending on you know, how many that you're using and what, how you're using them and the, these sites are well able to help you on your way to doing that um, another oftentimes free way we could do this is simply uh, take an image like the one on the right here uh, put it into an image editing software and be able to simply convert it to a grayscale um, so make it from black to white um, across the, the span of our colors this can work depending, again, once again, on the certain types of colors being used. However, sometimes the problem that ends up with this is that if you have dark colors at different ends of the spectrum, or so for example, if we were able to do this for this map above, we might run into a problem where these very dark blues and purples um, and the dark uh, reds um, into maroonish type color um, end up both being very dark gray or black. And because they're very different ends, you know, essentially ends of the spectrum in terms of temperature, we wouldn't be able to necessarily tell them apart and know which was which um, if we were looking at a map and, and, and just simply set it to grayscale. So there can be a problem. Um, usually that map might also have to be remade um, and essentially go from white on one end of the spectrum to uh, a dark or black at the other end. And also there is now you know, with technologies um, some ability for um, you know, color deficiency correcting eyewear that's out there. Um, there are, you know, people are able to get certain glasses or other eyewear that can help correct for this um, but I don't want to emphasize that as much as oftentimes for us especially if we're going to be consuming and or creating our own maps or visual media oftentimes um, I don't want to have that be as emphasized of a um, route to take simply in that you know, that's not necessarily accessible to everyone it's not you know it's no we can't push that on other people to correct for themselves or rather we should you know, as much as we can move to making sure that our visual media at least are in, created in ways that allow for color, color deficiency safe colors you know and that can be simple even as if you want to use a really nice vibrant cool color scheme um, in the visual media you're making you know you can make that but also then maybe make a separate one that uses the same data um, and then employs a, also a color deficiency safe color scheme just things to keep in mind once again that hopefully extend beyond this course um, but also are going to be relevant in terms of a lot of the maps and materials that we're using within this course I've done my best to try and draw use as much uh, maps and other media they're going to be color deficiency safe can't guarantee every single case um, that's going to happen um, I myself I'm trying to make sure that I, I lock that up and make sure that it, it, um, we are not having that problem but if you uh, uh, do find yourself in this condition where you have color deficiency issues and you're having issues with the maps that I'm providing, please let me know. I'm definitely going to try and um, do everything I can to make sure that we resolve that issue. Again, just things I want to bring up 
and hopefully all, all this material um, that we just went through is going to be important and in feeding into some of the assignments now that you're going to be working on, uh, especially like the lab, um, through this first module.